The madness starts at one minute past midnight on the third Thursday of November, when Beaujolais Nouveau is officially released. More than half of the 60 million bottles of this French red wine leave their native villages in southern Burgundy to begin the journey by plane, ship, train, truck, motorcycle, elephant, rickshaw, and on foot to wine lovers around the world. Only weeks before this hot-off-the-press wine was still Gamay grapes clustered on local vines. But the Beaujolais vintners work feverishly fast to harvest, ferment, and bottle the juice so it's ready for the midnight hour. The worldwide release of Beaujolais Nouveau is an extraordinary feat of coordination and marketing. Because of different time zones, the Nouveau is jetted to each country just a few days before its official release at local time. Most of us have to wait at least until the next morning to sample the new harvest. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people? hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 155. What's all the fuss about Beaujolais Nouveau on the third Thursday of every November? Should you stay up until midnight to taste the new release? And how is Beaujolais Nouveau different from the Beaujolais Cru wines? You'll get those answers and more wine tips on today's episode where I'm going solo. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of me talking to myself. Uh, actually, to you, of course. I'm talking to you. A link to the CTV video where I also chatted about Beaujolais Nouveau, where you can buy my books, and how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, as well as where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 155. Now on a personal note, before we dive into the show, on the weekend, Miles and I booked our first out-of-country trip in two years. Ha! Ah, we're not going far, Naples, Florida, but I'm really excited to travel again. I love the long sandy beach there, and the restaurants are amazing. In fact, I often joke with Miles that we need to make dining reservations before we look into hotels. Anyway, it's the anticipation of the trip that's half the joy of travel for me. How about you? Do you feel that way about travel as well? Let me know. Okay, on with the show. The madness starts at one minute past midnight on the third Thursday of November, when Beaujolais Nouveau is officially released. More than half of the 60 million bottles of this French red wine leave their native villages in southern Burgundy to begin the journey by plane, ship, train, truck, motorcycle, elephant, rickshaw, and on foot to wine lovers around the world. Only weeks before this hot-off-the-press wine was still Gamay grapes clustered on local vines. But the Beaujolais vintners work feverishly fast to harvest, ferment, and bottle the juice so it's ready for the midnight hour. The worldwide release of Beaujolais Nouveau is an extraordinary feat of coordination and marketing. Because of different time zones, the Nouveau is jetted to each country just a few days before its official release at local time. But since most local liquor stores around the world are closed at one minute after midnight, most of us have to wait at least until the next morning to sample the new harvest. In fact, one Beaujolais vintner recommends drinking his wine the day after bottling, with breakfast. Parisians, of course, get to drink it the moment it's released. French merchants who sell Nouveau before its official release are fined $250 per bottle, but outside France, most retailers simply sign an agreement not to do so. Beaujolais is nestled in the rolling hills of southern Burgundy, just north of the medieval city of Lyon, where the Rhone and the Saône rivers converge. 
Drinking Nouveau started here as an event to celebrate the end of the harvest. Festivities included floating barrels down the river to Lyon. From the quay, barrels were rolled to tents pitched in the center of the city, where celebratory wine tasting, dancing, and fireworks lasted for three days. Word of this exuberantly fruity wine spread to Paris, where bistros would serve it in carafes and post window signs proclaiming, Le Beaujolais Nouveau est arrivé. Le Beaujolais Nouveau has arrived. By 1985, the celebration had spread around the world. The quality of Beaujolais Nouveau has traditionally been thought of as an indication of the caliber of the rest of the vintage, which remains aging in barrels until it's bottled the following spring. In fact, some tipplers regard Nouveau as a harbinger of the entire French vintage, even though the country's many microclimates don't justify this assumption. The marketing makeover from quaint local custom to fashionable global drink has boosted the wine's popularity, not to mention its cash flow, since winemakers get an immediate return for the harvest rather than having to wait until the wine matures. Instead of trying to compete with the elegant red burgundies made from the Pinot Noir grape, Beaujolais vintners decided to emphasize the strengths of the Gamay grape and make a virtue out of youthful wine. Beaujolais Nouveau is appreciated as a wine to be quaffed in the spirit of celebration, with none of the usual sniffing and sipping reserved for complex wines. If Beaujolais is a structured Bach overture and Burgundy is a romantic Beethoven sonata, then Beaujolais is an infectious folk tune that gets your toes tapping. Another reason to drink the new wine early is the nature of the Gamay grape, full of rustic vigor that is different from other French grapes. So different are they that in 1395, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, branded them as wicked and disloyal and ordered all the vines to be uprooted. Fortunately, his purge wasn't successful. Six centuries later, we still delight in drinking a wine that's like fresh fruit, or as the French say, a bouquet of field flowers in a velvet-lined basket. But as the wine ages past six months, the bright fruit character tends to fade, so quench your thirst early to capture those vivacious raspberry and cherry flavors. Beaujolais has often been called the only white wine that's red. Its refreshing lightness is similar to white wine, as in fact it's served chilled at about 16 degrees Celsius. The secret to Nouveau's vibrant character is a winemaking technique called carbonic maceration. In vogue since the 1960s, it differs from traditional methods. Instead of crushing the grapes before fermenting them, whole clusters are fermented, thereby reducing the contact between the juice and the tannic skin and seeds. The resulting wine has low tannins, deep color, and an incredible fruitiness with a distinctive banana smell sometimes. This tooth sweet technique also means the wines don't age well and should therefore be consumed within six months of their release. One advantage, at least you won't have to memorize any vintage charts. Only half the wine produced in Beaujolais is released as Nouveau, and it's only produced in two of the region's three districts. Beaujolais, the basic appellation that makes the majority of the wine, and the higher quality Beaujolais Village. The third and highest level, Beaujolais Cru, comprises the output of 10 villages that produce world-class wines, best consumed after a few years in the cellar. Bruy, Chenas, Cheroube, Cote de Bruy, Fleury, Genas, Morgan, moulin vin Regigny, and Saint-Amour. These Cru wines are released after having done their Easter duty of resting in the barrel until spring. However, Morgan and Moulin Vin have been known to age to up to 10 years with distinction, at which point they can be as fine as Burgundian Pinot Noir of the same age. Beaujolais Nouveau owes much of its fame to Georges de Boeuf, dubbed by the media as the King of Beaujolais. A passionate promoter of the wine, de Boeuf controls 10% of Beaujolais production and his wines with their floral labels are available in most countries. Other reputable labels to try include Bouchard Anne, Joseph Druin, Louis Jadot, Jafflin, Momassin, and Rodet. With prices generally in the range of $10 to $15, Nouveau is one of the best values on the liquor store shelf. All that's Nouveau isn't Beaujolais, however. 
many other regions of France, such as Touraine, Ardèche, and languedoc roussillon also make a nouveau-style wine, often using gamay grapes and carbonic maceration. Modern stabilizing techniques have enabled nouveau to be produced from hardier grapes, such as Syrah and Merlot, without sacrificing the spirited character. Jean-Jean Syrah Primeur and Jean-Jean Saveur d'Autumne Syrah, Vin de Pays d'Ot from southern France, have more body than Beaujolais, but still offer that essence of bright red berries. The concept of new wine isn't confined to France. Italy offers novellos. Reputable producers include Mezza Corona, Vino Novella, Atticino, and Negra Valpalcello, Vino Novello de Veneto. Even the New World makes Nouveau and respects the French tradition of releasing it in November. Well-known California wineries include Beringer, Fetzer, Sebastiani, and J. Lohr, who use Gamay grapes or else they blend Pinot Noir and Syrah. Ontario Nouveaux include Chateau des Charmes Gamay Nouveau and Pili Island Gamay Noir Nouveau. These two are bursting with raspberries, cherries, and refreshing acidity. Another reason to drink Nouveau is it's one of the most food-friendly of wines. It was a traditional bistro drink, after all, and so it complements bistro fare such as a simple roast chicken, smoked ham, salmon, cold cuts, salads, and pasta. On its own, it's one of the most easily quaffable wines. In fact, Beaujolais Nouveau makes a great transitional wine for anyone wanting to move from white to red wines. It's also ideal for anyone who's tired of tannic Cabernet Sauvignons or gets headaches from big red wines. Beaujolais allows us one last sip of fall harvest before winter settles in. This carefree wine slips past the analytical mind and goes directly to the heart of happiness. And just some Beaujolais by the numbers, some interesting stats here to share with you. Nine grape bunches are used to make one bottle of wine. The total weight of Beaujolais Nouveau bottles produced is about 43,000 tons. The bottles make their initial journey out of villages in 2,000 trucks. 450 planes carry 5,500 tons of bottles to their final destination. Those that travel by train are stacked in 23 pallets of 50 cases. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Beaujolais Nouveau. Let me know if you try it this year. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of me talking to myself, to you, of course, links to where you can buy my books, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 155. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Gina Birch and Julie Glenn, who together host the podcast Great Minds on NPR Radio. They've got lots of terrific stories and tips to share with you. In the meantime, if you missed episode 92, go back and take a listen. I chat about unusual wine and cheese pairings that are really delicious with expert Laura Worland. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. What you're looking for, ideally, when you are pairing, is one of three things. The way I define them is that you have what I call Switzerland. So you have this neutral pairing, and you have the cheese, and you have the wine, and you have them together, and they're fine. You know, they taste fine. Nothing wrong. They play well in the sandbox together. And then you have what I call the Titanic. So... (laughs) As we all know, that didn't end very well. And so you have the cheese and you have the wine and together they make these other flavors that you kind of wish you hadn't had. (laughs) Luckily, that doesn't happen very often. What are the bad flavors? Just the clashing or other? Well, it can be, for instance, soapy. So the same kind of cheese that you're eating, the soft ripened cheese. Yes. With that kind of cheese, the rind is the first thing that starts to deteriorate when it's going downhill. So you will taste that and taste it with wine. And at first it might taste fine, but then all of a sudden it kind of goes south. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in learning more about Beaujolais Nouveau. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. 
perhaps a vibrant, juicy, well, of course, Beaujolais Nouveau. Cheers. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.